Einstein. I think that works. Okay, I will try to do that a little different because my way is not to develop things from papers. My way is to develop things from reality. I would talk about social work as an international approach. And uh, social work as an international approach is something which is, if we take IFS, part of our history. We are proud of, and we are proud of the international exchange we have and we will have here. But, and we forget that something, it's nothing new. It's something which is there for all the time IFS have been there, or the settlements have been there. It is, in certain ways, part of our DNA. And uh, I will try to have a look at this history we have of international exchange. And I will do it um, as a German professor uh, who is entering our dark room of history, full of different things. And I will have a German torchlight from Stuttgart Frankfurt Bosch with me. So you won't see all. You will see some things I can see. I will try to highlight it. And you will see it from a German perspective. Our history is much more rich. But if I would do that, you never would go out here till uh, midnight. So I won't do that. So you get a German perspective and I have a look at our history. And I will start in 1884 with Tornby Hall. Samuel and Henry Barnett, they found the first settlement in England and they basically the founding family or the founding fathers and mothers of the settlement movement. In the next 30 years, most of the important people developing social work in Germany and in the US go to Tornby Hall. They are knowing each other, they exchange ideas with each other, and they're learning from each other. So let's have a look at this crowd. First, I would like to have a look at Stanton Coit. He is founder of the first American settlement, of university settlement in uh, the United States, but he also holds a PhD, or was holding a PhD from the university here in Berlin because he was a student in Berlin till 1885. And then from there he went to Tornby Hall, stayed three months in Tornby Hall, and then went to the US and founded the first settlement in the US. He got help from two other important persons. I will mention Charles Bernstein Stover, who also studied in Berlin and James Joseph Speyer, who as a banker got his training in Frankfurt am Main in Germany. So from the beginning, you had an international exchange of ideas, you had an international perspective in the settlement movement. And in the next years, who comes also in this crowd? It is Jane Adams in 1889 with Hull House, and it's Al Salomon uh, who basically started working in the 90s but as the founding date today, the school gives the year 1908. And not to forget the founding father and mother of the settlement movement here in Germany, Sigmund Friedrich Schulze and Maria von Malzahn, or Countess Maria von Malzahn, who founded the first German settlement in 1911 here in East Berlin. All these people had been to Tornby Hall. All these people were knowing each other, and all these people, people visited each other, which is sometimes a little bit surprising because they had no planes or so. They had to go by ship, but it took a long time. So there was a lot of effort in to keep these connections going so you can see how important it was for these people. And they were forming an international relationship. Friedrich and Sigmund Schulze, Friedrich Sigmund Schulze and Alice Salomon went to Hullas in Chicago. Jane Adams came to Berlin and had a look. On the first school of social work here in Germany, uh, American social work um, literature was mandatory. They had to read it. And they had to read it in English because there was no German translation. So you can see the expectations and the standards in the founding situation of social work. German students from this school, as for example Elsa Munsterberg, went to New York and Chicago settlements and had practical courses there to learn how it's done and in 1911, Elsa Münsterberg finally translated Jane Adams 20 years in Hull House into German, and it was used as educational paper here in Germany. Most spectacular, and it was mentioned before, in 1915, Jane Adams visited Berlin in the midst of the First World War. And she had 
the knowledge of Rudolf Wilson, that the, the then American president, to talk to the German government to look for an armistice, for a possibility to stop the shooting. Alice Salomon and Friedrich Sigmund Schulze managed that she got a date with the then German chancellor and the German foreign minister. So she was not talking to some person somewhere. She was talking really to the German government and they were trying to solve the problem. Unfortunately, they failed. Anyway, the international relationship flourished. And in the 20s, there was a lot of exchange between Friedrich Sigmund Schulze and Ali Salomon on one side and uh, Jane Addams and the American social worker on the other side. But when darkness fell on Europe in 1933, this relationship came to an end. Um, Alice Salomon and uh, Friedrich Sigmund Schulze were expelled from Germany and the German settlements shattered in the war to come. On the other side, and that is very interesting and maybe something which gives hope when there is dark spots in the picture, as they always, uh, in this darkness, the seeds for the new development were laid. In 1922, a young German social worker trained in the German settlement here in Berlin, Hertha Krause, was appointed by the then mayor of Cologne, Konrad Adenauer, as head social worker of Cologne. Because she had a, fam a Jewish family background, she then already was a member of the Quaker movement, she had to leave Germany in 1933 to save her life, and she went to the S and became an important person in the American settlement movement and in the Quaker movement in the United States. In 1944, the then to his flat confined stout conservative Konrad Adenauer, who was after the war the first German chancellor, sneaked a letter out to her where he asked her, a leftist social, social worker, come back to Germany when the war is over and help rebuild. And that also should remind us to something we sometimes forget. Social work is not a leftist project. Social work is a human project and has to be include everybody who is willing to fight for the better good. After war, Krause came back to Germany as a representative of the American Friends uh, Service Committee. And she was vital together with the American military administration to rebuild the, the German settlement movement. So in 1952, uh, you had 13 settlements in Germany, at which was the founding of our foundation today. And as you can see, again, international relations are built into the DNA of the German and the international settlement movement to get all these things going and get us together today in Berlin. But if you are so used to something as such essential as international relations, you often start to forget what is the true value of this international possibilities we have. So I will try with three examples to show the merits which, is international, which, is, which an international approach in social work can give us in the exchanges we have. And I will take this from Europe because I know Europe very well and Europe is a very small space with a lot of cultures and this painful and complicated history. But on the other side, this painful and complicated history has given us something like a real life laboratory. There is lots of different approaches to social problems. There's lots of different solutions to these problems. So we have the wonderful possibility to see the results of different approaches. We don't have to discuss what will happen if we do it that way in 20 years. No, we can go in other countries and see what happened there because they did it different than us. So we have the ability to compare our approaches and learn from one another. And in this process, there is a few special possibilities I like to point out. And first, I like to look in Europe at the area where German is spoken, that is not only Germany, that is also in some areas, Poland, Denmark, Belgium, Luxembourg, France, Switzerland, Austria, Italy, and Liechtenstein. And my first example will be to go to North Italy. 
There is an area called South Tyrol where predominantly German is spoken. 70% of the population there speaks German. Now, if you go there, and I'm just looking down here, we just did that together this year, um, uh, and you go there in the social work institutions, something striking is happening. You see, under Italian law, strictly confined Italian law, under inter Italian constitutions, um, under the Italian con constitution, you see organizations, and they look like Austrian or German organizations. They don't look Italian. And then if you ask the people, what's going on here? You get this clouded answer, we look north. Yeah? What you can see and what you can learn here is, cultural concepts are much more powerful than state structures and laws. This is a lesson to learn. Don't complain that you are hampered by your state government, by your laws to reach your goals. I would say use the powerful tool of cultural concepts and get this overcome idea crashed and this deadlock politicians on the run. And we have this tool, it's there, it's always there, and in our societies with this, with, with this diversity we have now, there's lots of these tools available where we can bypass these conservative ways of laws and structures we are facing. The second example may be even more interesting. It's the border region of German and France. And that border moved in the last 150 years, back and forth. Now, first, France moved in under Napoleon, and when they pulled out, something astonishing happened. West of the Rhine Valley, French law, even under German jurisdiction, you see my German, by my English gets rusty, um, stayed intact. They didn't wipe it out. It was, more, it, was, it was better. It worked better. So you had a German state, a Prussian state, partly with French law. Now, when in the war 1870, the German-French war, Alsace and Lorraine became part of Germany, the same thing happened again. The code Napoleon was, let be the common law in this area, so we had in the German Reich two areas of laws. But more important, in between 1883 and 1888, Bismarck introduced the pillars of the social state in Germany, which was basically health insurance, accident insurance as uh, if you have a work accident, and uh, pen a pension system for every citizen uh, who had some kind of work. So, when Alsac and Lorraine came back to France in 1918, the French government was facing a problem. This population had paid into the system for 30 years. They had rights there, and they were used to this system. And the rest of France didn't have a system like this. So with the resources available, they had no chance to build up the system in the rest of France. On the other side, if they would have abolished the system, it was very clear they would have a very, very critical political situation and get most of the people against them. So what happens? The system is still there. It's today called the regime, local, the regime local. So you still have, in parts of France, the German social system running. And what you can see and what you can learn here, and that's also very important, especially when you're in these crisis situations we are in, um, conservative gov government often tries to threaten, to take an, away social entitlements. That's very difficult. If you really want to take away social entitlement, uh, entitlements, that's not easy to do, and these governments, in most of the cases, are threatened us much more than they are able to do. So I would ask to be more cool, to be more aggressive, and to be asking more for the rights of people, because the ability of these politicians to take these things away, or not giving these things, at least in developed countries, is much lesser than these political people think. So, let's have a look at my last example. The third example, I will compare two countries. I will have a look, a short look, at child protection in Great Britain and in Germany. And if you do that, you have the feeling you go into mirror worlds. If in Germany a child is taken out of a family, we normally, in most of the cases, put it in residential care 
and in very few cases, we put it in fostering care. Great Britain does the opposite. In Great Britain, in most of the cases, it goes in foster care, and in very few cases, it goes in, it goes in residential care. I will not judge what is better, but I will point out the opportunity that these two, uh, two different systems give us. You can compare the outcomes. You can see on different levels, costs, child development, what happens to these people in 10, 15, 20 years, because the systems are there for a long time. You can compare the professional perspectives the social workers have, with what kind of approach they're working, how do they do this, all this is possible, and gives you a rich environment where you can learn. And I think this is the most important thing. You have a tremendous chance to get new ideas. You can ask yourself, do I do the right thing? Or maybe there a different approach. No better way to uh, take the words from a very famous song in my, uh, when I was young. No better way to look in the mirror. And maybe a chance to do better. So at the end of my little speech, I would like to wish you all that we will have this wonderful exchange here, that we will use this possibility we have. We are from so many different countries. We are representing so many different approaches that we listen to one another, that we teach one another, that we learn from one another, and that we are again getting water from this rich well of our international relation, which may be the most valuable thing we have in our association. And so I like again to say to you, welcome to Berlin. Let's start the show, get back to our roots. And now in getting back to our roots, Melissa will come and will try to pick up. <laughs>